Welcome to the newest entry in our foreign and comparative law webinar series. My name is Jenny Gessley, and I'm a foreign law specialist here at the Law Library of Congress. And today I will be talking to you about central bank digital currencies, the future of the monetary system. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping announcements at the beginning. We ask you that you please use the Q&A feature to um, submit your questions. I will try to leave time at the end uh, for Q&A. And hopefully we'll get to all of your questions. Um, if we don't have time to answer all the questions, you can also use our Ask a Librarian service. And um, I have the address for that on my last slide. So you can use that feature or also if after the webinar is over, uh, you have another question, you can submit those uh, questions using that service. Um, if you have trouble with your computer audio, you can also switch to phone audio. And I would also like to point out that this session is being recorded. Okay, so let's get started. This is uh, the outline for my presentation. So I will start with some general definitions um, so that we're all on the same page and we all know what we're talking about. Then I will talk about central bank digital currencies in general. Uh, I will give an overview of the definition, certain um, design concepts, um, some benefits, advantages, risks associated with that, what the progress has been so far. Um, so, but in more general ways. And after that, I will talk about specific examples from jurisdictions around the world. I will talk about some advanced economies, about some emerging market and developing countries. And uh, we will see how much progress they have made and how they have structured um, the CBDCs that are already out there. And like I said, at the end, hopefully there will be time for Q&A. So technology and digitalization are changing the way we pay. The COVID-19 pandemic has actually only accelerated that trend from cash, um, away from cash and to digital payments. And we all know cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are experiencing all time highs. However, we've also seen the volatility of cryptocurrencies um, when, for example, the price of Bitcoin just last week, dropped by almost 30% after there were concerns about tighter regulations in China. And then Tesla's announcement that first that it would accept Bitcoin, then that it would not accept Bitcoin anymore. And then I saw that Elon Musk uh, just recently tweeted again, which um, had an effect on various cryptocurrencies. So we can see there's a lot of uh, volatility in this area. Um, so actually sometimes called the Tinkerbell effect, if you've heard that term before. Um, that means that um, the price will fall and rise depending on what people believe it's worth. So that if they believe, for example, now um, you can use this means of payment, it will be worth more. Um, and if not, then not. And central banks are taking note of this development, that people are moving away from cash, that um, private, privately issued tokens are suddenly used as means of payment. And one of the main functions of central banks is to ensure monetary and financial stability in their respective jurisdictions and to promote broad access to safe and efficient payments. So and a core instrument by which central banks achieve all these objectives is by providing central bank money. And uh, traditionally, though, central banks have limited access to digital account based central bank money. Um, those are also known as reserves or settlement balances. So they have um, limited access to banks and certain other financial public institutions. And by contrast, physical central bank money, so cash, um, is widely accessible to the public. But in some jurisdictions, as I already mentioned, the use of cash is decreasing with the possibility of its complete disappearance. For example, Sweden would be um, a prime example of this. And this would imply that the public no longer has wide access to central bank money. So and that's one point where central bank digital currencies come in. Um, but I should say that uh, reasons for adopting a central bank digital currencies or um, CBDC and the different design choices, they really depend on many different factors. And they're also different in each individual jurisdiction. And we will look at all these uh, reasons more in detail later on. There's also um, differences um, between emerging market economies and um, advanced economies for adopting a CBDC. So let's talk about some general definitions. 
So first of all, we'll start with the basics. What is money? And money is really defined um, by its functions. So money has three basic functions. One, it's a means of exchange. That uh, means that it's anything that is widely accepted as a means of payment. Two, it's a unit of account, which means it's a standard measure of value that allows us to compare the value of things. And third, it's a store of value, which means it's an item that holds the value over time. And money actually differs from other stores of values because it's readily exchangeable um, for other commodities. So um, we see from this definition though, money can actually be anything that fulfills these basic functions. So it doesn't have to be coins and paper money, which is what we normally think of when we think about money. We think, um, yeah, coins and paper money. But it could be for anything, um, for example, cigarettes in prison, so I heard, um, is used as money there. It's also not um, risk-free store of valuable money. Inflation reduces the value of money. And if we have times of rapid inflation, people may not want to rely on money anymore uh, as a store of value. So they might, may turn to other things, commodities such as land or gold. So what are the types of money that exist? There's um, really only two types of money. So money with intrinsic value and then money without intrinsic value. So money with intrinsic value is also called commodity money because it's backed by commodities such as gold or silver. Um, so it has, it's money that has value apart from its use as money. The problem though with commodity money is that the quantity can fluctuate radically and it also may vary in, in quality. Uh, an example for um, commodity money is the gold standard which is a monetary system where a country's currency or paper money has a value uh, which is directly linked to gold. That was, for example, um, the case in the US up until 1971, um, when the US um, abandoned the gold standard. And currently there's no um, countries that use the gold standard anymore. Then we have money without intrinsic value. It's also um, called fiat money. Fiat is Latin and means uh, let it be done. So this is just um, money that some authority, which is generally the government, has ordered to be accepted as a medium of exchange. So it's not backed up by a commodity, but by the full faith and credit of the authority that issued it. And you've probably heard that term. So currencies nowadays, the US dollar, the euro, um, those are all uh, fiat currencies. Um, I'm saying currency, currency is um, the coin and paper money of a country that is designated as legal tender which circulates and is customarily used and accepted as a medium of exchange in the country of issuance. Um, we should also define legal tender while we're at it. Um, this is the money that's designated by law as well as legal offer of payment for debts when it's tendered to a creditor. You can, if you've ever looked at a um, dollar bill, for example, um, it says it on there. So if you wanna take a look at that. So now we're getting closer. Um, digital currencies. What are digital currencies um, or digital money? This is really any form of money or payment that exists only in electronic form. So for example, um, deposit at banks. We all, um, most of us probably have a bank account with a commercial bank. So this is a digital currency. Then we have virtual currencies. And um, I put that in quotation marks um, to differentiate it from um, currencies that we just talked about. And how are the virtual currencies defined? Um, there isn't an official definition, um, and but there are several definitions that are very similar. And I'm going to take the definition from the European Union, though that's actually one that um, is in the law there. It says it's a digital representation of value, which is not issued or guaranteed by a central bank or public authority. It is also not necessarily attached to a legally established currency. And we'll see um, some examples um, so or some um, exceptions there in a little bit. It does not possess a legal status of currency or money, but it is accepted by natural legal persons as a means of exchange and it can be transferred, stored and traded electronically. Um, we also, the IRS in the United States has a similar definition. Um, the IRS defines virtual currency as a digital representation of value, which functions as a medium of exchange a unit of account and or a store of value. So what we did, we talked about the definition of money. Um, that's what we hear here. 
But they say RSS in some environments, virtual currency may actually operate like a real currency, but it does not have legal tender status in the US. So what are cryptocurrencies? Cryptocurrencies are um, a type of virtual currency, um, but they use cryptographic algorithms to validate and secure transactions. And those transactions are digitally recorded on a distributed ledger, such as a blockchain, and they're very volatile, which we already talked about. And the question here really, um, are they money? Is, uh, are they widely accepted as a medium of exchange? Um, that's really the question that's normally debated there. Um, more, I mean, we know Bitcoin is probably here to stay as uh, more and more used, but it's still not widely accepted as a medium of exchange. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. And that's probably more uh, academic discussion. Then I would also um, like to define stable coins because that's also important in this regard. Um, stablecoins are a type of cryptocurrency that is uh, backed by sovereign fiat currencies or other safe assets, such as the US dollar, to stabilize their value. So they want to counter the volatility of uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, and most of the stablecoins that have been issued were, uh, are pegged to the US dollar. So in this regard, um, we also need to mention cryptocurrencies backed by corporations because those are actually um, one of the reasons that have been cited why central banks should um, get into the business of issuing digital currencies. Um, so one of the examples that probably the one, the most important one that people um, heard about was uh, Facebook's DM, uh, formerly called Libra. Um, so this will be um, cryptocurrency backed by corporations are backed by the asset reserves of the institution that issues them. And Facebook obviously has uh, lots and lots of users, millions of users. So um, that would be um, quite some competition for central banks. So I would like to go um, a little bit more detail um, here, just so um, because, like I said, um, it's a reason why central banks might issue central bank digital currencies. So Facebook was originally planning to get a payment system license in Switzerland from um, FINMA, the regulator there. Um, but those plans were abandoned. And now they decided they will move the operations to the United States and only issue, for now at least, uh, a dollar-backed stablecoin. DM initially proposed a universal currency tied to a basket of major currencies and government debt. But then they switched to multiple stablecoins after criticism. And um, in the US now, um, the exclusive issue of DM US dollar will be Silvergate Bank, which is a California state chartered bank. Um, you might be wondering why this uh, state chartered bank um, will be issuing the stablecoin for Facebook. Uh, well, in July 2021, the Office of the Control of the Currency released a notice which uh, letting banks provide a variety of services for assets issued on a blockchain, especially stablecoins. And it's also been reported that DM will launch a small scale pilot later this year. So we'll see how the public reacts to it. Um, if it will be, um, yeah, if they trust Facebook enough or if this project will actually happen. Um, and it will be quite interesting to see. So let's move on to um, our topic today, central bank digital currencies. So what are central bank digital currencies? So there's no official definition of what they are. The new form of central bank money, and it would fulfill all the functions of money that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, the Bank for International Settlement, uh, which is also often called the Central Bank of Central Banks, in 2018 defined central bank digital currencies as a digital form of central bank money that is different from balances in traditional reserve or settlement accounts. Um, so they say it would be it would be central bank issued electronic money. It would be denominated in the national unit of account. That's also important. So if it's a foreign um, currency, that wouldn't be a central bank digital currency. And um, most importantly, it would be a liability of the central bank. Um, even if it's issued through uh, intermediaries, it would be a liability of the central bank and not, not of the intermediary. And because of all this, there would be low volatility. Um, and in connection with that, you might have heard some academics, um, commentators talk about um, synthetic CBD, uh, CBDCs, but those are not actually uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, so what are they? Um, so it's been suggested that um, private sector payment service providers could issue liabilities 
And those would be matched by funds held at the central bank. Um, but here you see um, it wouldn't be a CBDC because the end user would not hold a claim on the central bank, um, but it would be a claim on the um, intermediary, the private sector payment service provider. So even though they're called synthetic CBDCs, they're not actually CBDCs according to the definition um, that I just talked about. So it's um, the progress so far on CBDCs. Um, and I, the data is from my uh, from a survey that the Bank for International Settlement um, published in January 2021. Um, that's actually already the third survey um, that they did on central bank digital currencies. And they found that um, it was conducted among 65 central banks. And they found that 86% of survey participants are actively researching the benefits and drawbacks of CBDCs. 60% conducting experiments or proofs of concept, and 14% are moving forward to development and pilot projects. And what was also very interesting is that seven out of eight central banks uh, that were in advanced stages of CBDC development were in emerging market and developing economies. Um, and like I said, I will um, talk about some specific examples in the third part of this presentation. So this is just a general numbers, a general overview. So what about consumers? Are consumers, is the public ready to adopt CBDCs? Uh, what's the most important thing for digital payments is really public trust. And I found a global opinion poll that was conducted in um, between October and December, 2019 uh, by the official monetary and financial institutions forum. Um, on public trust in monetary institutions, payment characteristics, and digital currency across 13 advanced and emerging countries. And they found that in almost all countries, the respondents indicated that they would feel most confident in digital money issued by the domestic monetary authority, so the central bank. They also uh, globally expressed actually a lack of confidence in digital money issued by a tech or credit card company. And that's was particularly true for respondents from advanced economies. So that uh, sounds like Facebook's DM would not really have a chance um, if central banks decide to issue central bank digital currencies. Um, then it was also interesting in the survey they found that across all countries, respondents were unanimous in citing safety from fraud and theft as the most important feature of digital currencies. And then second were privacy protections. And speed was actually the least important characteristic. So that's something that central banks um, need to uh, keep in mind when they design their central bank digital currencies. And in general, emerging market respondents were much more open to digital money than their advanced economy counterparts. And there were also some differences depending on income, um, um, then also depending on age, and then um, yeah, level of education played a role. So what are some of the design choices? And this is just a um, very high level overview. So first of all, we have to decide, um, should it be widely accessible or just restricted access? Then the degree of anonymity um, could be ranged uh, from complete anonymity to no anonymity at all. Um, operation availability, ranging from current opening hours to 24-7. Interest in bearing characters, yes or no. Um, and I will talk about this problem later. It could make interest could make them more attractive and similar to deposits, but they could also have um, influence on um, commercial banks. So we'll talk about that later though. And then um, connected to that is the question, should or will there be limits or caps on individual holdings? So those are just some of the considerations that central banks have to look into. So there are really uh, two models under discussion. So one is a wholesale CBDC, where access would be limited to a predefined group of users. And then we have the retail CBDCs, which are also called general purpose CBDCs, which would be widely accessible. So the equivalent, a digital equivalent of cash for use by end users. Um, and I will focus on the retail CBDCs for this webinar. Um, because that's uh, the most interesting uh, for our purposes. 
Um, I would like to note a lot of central banks have done advanced research or in advanced stages of um, development of wholesale CBDCs, um, but this is uh, unfortunately beyond the scope of this webinar. Um, so what are some of the reasons for a central bank to adopt a CBDC? Um, we already talked about um, declining cash usage in some jurisdictions, so that could be um, a factor especially um, for emerging markets and developing economies, improved financial inclusion for unbanked or underbanked communities um, is a factor, a very, like the most important factor, basically. And then in general, the interest in technological innovations for the financial sector, making uh, payment uh, systems more efficient, fast, instant, um, that, that could be a reason. And then what we talked about, um, um, the fear that central bank money in transactions will be replaced with private digital tokens like, like Facebook's DM. The question here is really um, the problem that they're volatile, um, there's inadequate consumer investor protection. Um, so central banks uh, really um, yeah, need to look into this so they can still fulfill their role. And then there's also the risk of um, so-called digital dollarization related to cross-border CBDCs. So what do I mean by that? Um, the term dollarization is normally shorthand for the use of any foreign currency by another country. So let's assume, for example, in the United States, um, Canada um, issues a CBC that's uh, highly um, yeah, uh, liked by people in the United States and suddenly everyone uses the Canadian CBDC, no one uses the US dollar anymore. And that would have an impact on the Federal Reserve's ability to conduct monetary policy and ensure financial stability. So that's definitely something that um, central banks are aware of um, and that they need to look into. So, and also, um, yeah, what are some of the legal, economic, technical considerations that go into developing a CBDC? And this list is by no means complete. I just put um, a few um, questions on here. The most important question probably is, does the central bank actually have the legal authority to issue a digital currency? And connected to that is the question, um, what will be the legal tender status of CBDCs? The BIS survey from 2021 that I talked about at the beginning found that 26% um, of the central banks do not currently have the authority to issue a CBDC. And 48% were unsure whether or not they would have um, the legal authority. So in those cases, it's um, probably the way the statute or wherever they get their authorization from is uh, phrased in such a way that it could be interpreted um, like that, but maybe not. And the question with regard to legal tender status, if um, it should be um, yeah, replacing or be equivalent to cash, then it would uh, need to have legal tender status. Another question is uh, compliance with anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing requirements. And connected to that um, is the question of privacy considerations. Um, so this is a particular concern with regard to anonymous CBDCs, um, which I already talked about before. Um, this is like one of the design choices. Should it be completely anonymous or should there be no anonymity or should it be somewhere in between? Um, that's the fear that um, CBDCs might be used for illicit purposes if they are completely anonymous. On the other hand, people prefer cash, among other things, because of its anonymity. So CBDCs would have to be designed in such a way that they provide something equivalent. Then there's also the um, problem that there might be um, a so-called digital run, flight from commercial banks to central banks in terms uh, in terms of prices and the risk of disintermediation of commercial banks. So what do I mean by that? We've all heard of bank crisis. So during a, system, a systemic banking crisis, um, holding risk-free central bank issued CBDCs would be suddenly vastly more attractive than bank deposits. So there could be a sector-wide run on bank deposits um, um, to CBDCs. So this would magnify the effects of the crisis. Um, so yeah a digital run. And the problem of disintermediation of commercial banks, so it really depends on what households um, will do. So if they substitute banknotes with um, CBDCs, 
then the central bank and commercial bank balance sheet will not really change. But um, if they, however, um, replace um, commercial bank deposits with CBDCs, um, then the extreme version of digital run, uh, then this would imply a funding loss for commercial banks. And this could lead to disintermediation of the banking sector. So this in turn would result that um, banks would have to try to offer better conditions on their deposits in order to protect their deposit base. But this then um, would imply higher funding costs for banks, which would be passed on to consumers. So you see there's um, a lot of things um, that banks, uh, central banks have to uh, think about. There might also be risks to central bank independence if they have a greater economic role. Um, what do I mean by this? Um, during emergencies, it has been suggested that a central bank could agree to act as a government agent and execute a CBDC fund transfers on the government's behalf to individuals and businesses. So, for example, now during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been suggested to use CBDCs to deliver stimulus packages to households and businesses. This also, I mean, you might have heard the term um, helicopter money. So this is what that is. Um, but the problem here is helicopter money is a form of fiscal policy. Um, and we need to separate monetary and fiscal policy um, in order to um, ensure central bank independence. So there should not be influence of politics on central bank. There should not be pressures to do certain things. So um, that's certainly something to keep in mind. And then in general, um, like that opinion poll that I mentioned showed, um, cybersecurity is a big issue um, because people are afraid of fraud and theft. So that definitely needs to go into the design of a digital currency. And then in general, also how what technical solution will be um, chosen for the CBDC is a question. So it could be um, a digital, the central bank could issue a digital currency token that would circulate in a decentralized way without central ledger. Um, it could use DLT technology such as blockchain. Um, the problem is really um, all those new technologies um, such as DLT, um, yeah, because they're new, um, we don't know as much about them yet. How robust are they? Central banks have been experimenting with them for a while, um, but they still don't know enough about it. So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, other ways to, um, yeah, for a technical solution for CBDCs, um, there could be deposit accounts with the central bank established for all households. Um, and then um, the actual servicing and technical maintenance of the accounts uh, would probably be assigned to one or several third party providers because otherwise central banks might be overwhelmed by this um, new task because they already have enough to do. So after all these uh, general remarks and general consideration, let's look at some examples from around the world and uh, what some of the countries have decided with regards to those uh, design features. So I would like to talk about first about the Bahamas, because on October 20th, 2020, the uh, Central Bank of the Bahamas launched the first worldwide retail CBDC. It's called the Electronic Bahamian Dollar, um, or also dubbed Sand Dollar. And they say its main purpose is to promote more inclusive access to regulated payments and other financial services for unbanked and underbanked communities and socioeconomic groups within the country. So that's also what we saw, um, that this is the primary motivation for emerging market um, and developing economies to issue CBDCs. Um, and in the Bahamas, um, the central bank didn't have the authority to issue electronic money or to make it legal tender. So that's why the uh, Central Bank of the Bahamas Act had to be amended, which they did in 2020. And um, I put the legal basis here on the slide. So Article 5, Paragraph 1H says that the functions of the bank are to issue and manage the currency. Paragraph 1P then says um, the functions are to regulate and oversee the issuance, provision, and functioning of payment instruments, which includes the issuance of electronic money. Then Article 1, um, Paragraph 1 uh, clarifies that the currency uh, of the Bahamas comprises notes, coins, and electronic money. And then Article 12 um, says that all notes and electronic money are legal tender. 
So it addresses all these issues. Sand dollars are then uh, stored on digital wallets, uh, maintained and offered through so-called wallet providers. And I will talk about what they are in just a second. So the Central Bank of the Bahamas Act, Article 15, authorized the central bank to uh, make regulations for the digital currency framework. And uh, public consultation on those draft regulations took place from February 15th to March 31st, 2021. Um, the central bank announced on their website that the finalized regulations would be issued by May 1st, 2021. However, um, I have not seen them uh, published to date. Um, they We'll probably do it soon, or I've just not um, seen them yet. Um, so what do they, uh, the reg draft regulations cover? So first of all, who qualifies to be a wallet provider? So um, they said that um, it's four groups, commercial banks, cooperative credit unions, money transmission businesses, and payment service providers. And as of mid-March 2021, nine wallet providers have completed um, the cybersecurity assessments of their technology systems and have been clear to distribute the CBDC. So, um, and they either use the, those wallet providers, they either use the Sand Dollar app, which has been uh, developed by the central bank, or they can use their own proprietary mobile apps. Um, and all those wallets though must have multi-factor authentication features. And um, no matter which app they use, um, they must be interoperable, or they will be at least in the future. All wallet providers must complete a robust and intensive cybersecurity assessment by an independent international firm before they can receive approval. Um, so they're really addressing here um, the fears of consumers that their um, privacy will not be protected or that their data will not be protected. Um, what else do the draft regulations cover? Um, the application process to become a wallet provider, uh, minimum standards of interoperability, uh, what I just uh, mentioned, then consumer protection aspects, financial stability, financial inclusion, because this is really the main purpose of the CBDC in the Bahamas, um, several obligations of wallet providers, um, wallet limits, and then enforcement powers. Um, so yeah, with regard to financial stability, um, so remember that we talked about disambiguation of commercial banks, um, risk to financial stability, uh, and what they did in the Bahamas uh, to counter uh, these fears is they said um, to constrain the ability of the sand dollar wallets to substitute for deposits at commercial banks. Um, the central bank would be empowered to limit the amount of the digital currency that individuals, businesses, and other non-supervised financial institutions can hold. And um, also no interest would be paid on digital currency held in mobile wallets. On the other hand, um, limits on the currency also have a problem if you want them to be equivalent to cash. Um, that could also be a future problem, but I guess we'll see how it plays out in the Bahamas. Other Caribbean jurisdictions um, have, are also very advanced already um, with their uh, CBDCs. Um, and that just confirms um, the results from the BIS survey that seven out of eight um, jurisdictions in advanced stages are in emerging markets and developing economies. So Jamaica, for example, on March 22nd, 2021, um, the Bank of Jamaica announced plans for its CBDC, and they say it will be hybrid CBDC, so a cross between wholesale and retail. And um, what's interesting is they said they will not use blockchain technology. Um, they will use the existing payment um, system framework. They say that's uh, efficient and um, enough. Um, also, currently, the BOJ does not have the right to issue digital currency as legal tender. So the BOJ Act amendment is also underway. And from um, now until December 2021, the um, CBDC in Jamaica will be tested. Um, so as a pilot CBDC solution, it will be tested in the FinTech regulatory sandbox. And the bank announced that um, they're planning on introducing the CBDC in early 2022. Then um, the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union uh, is also is in advanced stages. If you don't know the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, um, it was established in 1983. And the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is the monetary authority there. Uh, it's a group of eight island economies, um, namely Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, 
Granada, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Granadines. So on March 31st, day, uh, 2021, they had the public rollout of um, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank's uh, CBDC and it's called Dcash. And it's just a digital version of the Eastern Caribbean dollar. Um, but currently they did not roll it out in all the countries. They're doing a 12 month pilot in just a few countries um, in Antigua and Barbuda, Granada, St. Kitts and Nevis and San Lucia. Um, so let's go to a different part of the world. Russia actually also just recently um, announced it, uh, its plans for, its, for the digital ruble. In October 2020, they published a public consultation paper. And then in April 2021, uh, they published a digital ruble concept based on this public consultation. And this concept describes all the specifics of implementation of the target model and the different dates. So um, what Russia is planning, they say by December 2021, they will create um, a prototype of a digital ruble platform. Then in January 2022, they will develop uh, draft amendments to um, the central bank legislation in order to give the central bank um, the right to issue a digital currency. And then first quarter of 2022, they will launch testing of the prototype of the digital ruble platform. And all these um, papers, the digital ruble concept, the digital ruble, um, they're available on the Bank of Russia website in English. So if you um, would like to read more about this, you can just go to the website and uh, read about all the details. So let's uh, go to China, which is uh, very interesting because it's one of the first, it's, it's the first central bank of a major economy to roll out a digital version of its currency. And you probably read about this um, in the news. There are several names for um, the digital currency. Um, DCAB, which stands for Digital Currency Electronic Payment, then Digital Remimbi, Digital Huan, or ECNY, but that's all the same. Um, so currently they're doing pilot projects in several major cities, um, but no official nationwide launch date has been announced yet. So for example, one of the pilot projects um, took place in February 2021 in Beijing during uh, Lunar New Year. Um, they handed out a total of 10 million um, won, which is around $1.5 million. And they were distributed through about uh, 50,000 packets of 200 won each, um, which is about $30. And recipients were able to spend the money at designated offline locations or on parts of an e-commerce website, JD.com. But those vouchers were only valid uh, for a certain time from February 10th to February 17th. And um, the test was also only open to those with a Chinese ID number or with residence permits from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan. And that was the third test um, of the digital currency. Um, and then, yeah, other major cities, for example, Shenzhen, um, had similar experiments. So currently, um, the uh, People's Bank of China doesn't have um, the legal authority to issue digital currency. Um, and the law needs to be amended. So that's why on October 23rd, 2020, um, the PBOC released draft revisions to the law for public comment. And the important article there is draft article 19. Um, and that would say that um, in its amended version, Remimbi includes both physical and digital forms. So that would be the legal basis for the PBOC to issue the digital currency. And the resistance of the law is on the 2021 legislative agenda of China's National People's Congress Standing Committee, um, but only as one of the preparatory projects. And uh, my colleague who covers China told me that means it's lower priority, so it's unlikely that it will be passed in uh, 2021. So how's um, the digital currency in China um, structured? So um, the digital currency will be issued by the PBOC to commercial banks and non-bank uh, payment platforms and other intermediaries. And those in turn will make the currency, digital currency available to end users. And uh, DCAP will be stored in digital maybe wallet apps. So similar to other um, digital payment apps that uh, people already have. Um, but it's important to note, again, it would be a direct liability of the PBOC and not of the commercial bank. They only act as intermediaries because otherwise it wouldn't uh, fall under the definition of a central bank digital currency anyway. And what's interesting, they said um, it will not be blockchain based, 
um, there will be conditional anonymity, um, they call it. So it means uh, privacy by design um, is um, integrated into the CBDC. So the data provided by users will be tiered. So depending on the amount, there will be different accounts. So general account, premium account, um, depending on which one it is, there will be a more data released or not. And then data access will also be highly restricted um, to yeah, eliminate um, privacy concerns. Um, supposedly there will also be support for dual offline payments, which means that both payer and payee can be offline. So similar to cash then. Um, and um, they say there will also be support for so-called smart contracts. So let's go to Sweden. Um, Sweden Central Bank started um, the eKrona project in 2017. Um, in case you're wondering why Sweden Central Bank um, is doing an eKrona project and why they're not part of the um, digital euro, why they don't have the euro, even though the European Union member state so all EU member states are part of the economic and monetary union and they coordinate their economic policy making to support the economic aims of the EU. But it's only a certain number of member states that have replaced their national currencies with the euro. And those member states form the euro area and the European Central Bank is the monetary authority for those um, countries, um, which is currently 19 EU member states, but Sweden is not one of them because they have not yet fulfilled all the necessary requirements for the adoption of the euro. They also don't have a target date. Um, so they call member states with a derogation. So in Sweden, it's still the central bank, which is a monetary authority and not the European Central Bank. So what's the purpose of um, the proposed e-krona in Sweden? They say they want to provide a public alternative to future commercial digital currencies. Um, so one of the um, reasons that we talked about and um, they also want to ensure that the trust in the monetary system is maintained. So they, those uh, go together. Um, if people flee to private, uh, privately issued digital tokens, um, that might undermine um, yeah, financial stability. They say it's technical solution they will uh, most likely use distributed ledger technology, uh, blockchain technology. And there's two phases um, in Sweden. So they just completed the first phase. Um, and they issued a report after this um, phase was completed. Um, that report, uh, English translation is also available on the website of Sweden Central Bank. So you can um, look, um, look at that if you um, are interested. Um, if you're familiar with our Global Legal Monitor website, my colleague also wrote an article about um, the report, which is available on that website. So you can also look at that. So in the first phase, um, the central bank evaluated what laws may apply to um, an official digital currency, um, whether or not the law of the central bank would need to be amended so they can issue such a currency. And they analyzed the diff um, different technical solutions of an e-krona in relation to anti-money laundering regulations. So the second phase will start now. Um, in that second phase, they will bring in commercial banks and other market participants to test how it might work practically. The Swedish government has also tasked a group with investigating the future role of the national state, uh, including the central bank in the Swedish payment market in general, and what role an official e-currency could play. But um, this report is not due until um, November 30th, 2022, so um, it's doubtful that we will see an official e-corona before that date. And um, yeah, the law would also have to be amended or a new law would have to be passed to allow the central bank to issue an e-krona. So what about the European Union? I have this nice quote here from Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank. She said that the euro belongs to Europeans and we are its guardian. We should be prepared to issue a digital euro should the need arise. Um, should the need arise uh, also indicates that they haven't made a decision yet on whether to launch a digital euro project. And they said they would make such a decision towards the middle of 2021. But on the other hand, um, they have done extensive preparations, which I will talk about now. Um, oh, and also just a quick remark, if you follow um, European Union news, in September of 2020, the European Commission uh, published a legislative proposal on markets and crypto assets, uh, also called Mika, 
which would regulate crypto assets that fall outside the scope of current EU financial market regulation. Um, but there's um, express exemption for central bank um, digital currencies. So Mika would not apply to CBDCs. Oop, that was uh, too much. I have to go back. Okay, here we go. Um, so in October of 2020, the European Union's um, high-level task force, the Eurosystem high-level task force, published um, its report on a digital euro. And in that report, it uh, defined a digital euro as a liability of the euro system recorded in digital form as a complement to cash and central bank deposits. That's important. They say um, it will not replace cash or central bank uh, deposits, which is one of the fears that suddenly there will be no more cash. Uh, for use in retail transactions available to the general public. And then they um, identified possible scenarios that would require the issuance of a digital euro. Um, so they say, first of all, if there's increased demand for electronic payments in the euro area in general, then we should issue um, a digital euro. Or if there's a significant decline in the use of cash as a means of payment, for example, um, like it happened in Sweden, if that would happen in the euro area, there would also be a reason to issue digital currency. Then they say the launch of global private means of payment, what we talked about, for example, Facebook's DM, suddenly everyone likes it, everyone uses it. Um, those could raise regulatory concerns and post risk. So that would also be a good reason that the central bank steps in. And then the problem of digital dollarization that we covered um, if there's a broad take up of CBDCs issued by foreign central banks and the European Central Bank would suddenly not be able to fulfill its functions anymore. Then in April 2021, um, the, um, a public consultation report was published. Um, but like I said, they haven't um, actually decided yet and they will decide by the middle of um, 2021 whether or not they will launch a digital euro project. But I just um, read an interview with uh, Fabio Panetta, who is a member of the executive board of the ECB. And he said that um, if we do it, um, the earliest date for CBDC would be 2026. So that's still um, a little longer until then. So not as advanced as other jurisdictions. And then one of the things that would have to be discussed in the European Union um, is the legal authority of the European Central Bank, because currently it doesn't have the legal authority to issue digital currency. Article 128 of the TFEU just states that the European Central Bank um, has the exclusive right to authorize the issue of euro banknotes within the EU, and that only such notes have legal tender status. And then the member states are authorized to issue bank coins, um, subject to approval by the ECB of the volume of issue. Um, so this is, um, first of all, they would ha um, have to amend the law to give them the general right to issue a digital currency, and then it would have to decide, would it be digital banknotes or digital coins? So depending on that, it would either be the ECB in charge or the member states. So that, those are still just some of the questions that need to be discussed in the European Union. So let's briefly talk about um, the United Kingdom, because on um, April 20, uh, 2021, the British finance minister floated the idea of a so-called, what he dubbed, Bitcoin. Um, and um, he floated that idea when he announced the creation of a CBDC task force between the Treasury and the Bank of England, which will coordinate the exploratory work on a potential a retail UK a CBDC. Um, but they have not yet made a decision on whether to introduce a CBDC. So this is just, you know, um, they're looking at different scenarios. And for that purpose, they also established two external engagement groups. So one is um, called the CBDC Engagement Forum, which would engage senior stakeholders and gather strategic input on all non-technology aspects. Um, so just the practical challenges. And then there would be a CBDC Technology Forum, which would uh, focus on the technology aspects of CBDC. So what uh, technology should they use? Um, and, but they already mentioned CBDCs would be introduced alongside cash and bank deposits. So like the um, European Central Bank, they want to make sure um, that people know um, that it will not replace cash and bank deposits, that it will be equivalent um, to cash, but it will not replace cash um, because not everyone necessarily wants a digital currency. 
So let's uh, switch to the United States and have another quote here um, from uh, Jerome Powell, who's the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And he said in April of 2021, it is far more important to get it right than it is to do it fast or feel that we need to rush to read con reach conclusions because other countries are moving ahead. So that shows us that um, the US is taking a more cautious approach with regard to CBDCs. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean though that um, the US is not researching CBDCs actively. It just means that no decision has been made yet on whether to issue a CBDC. So for example, in August, 2020, Boston's Federal Reserve announced a multi-year collaboration with MIT's Digital Currency Initiative to develop a hypothetical CBDC. And what they do there, uh, they're exploring the use of existing and new technologies uh, to build and test a hypothetical digital currency platform. So they're uh, focusing here on the technology aspect. Um, and then there's also uh, some bills were proposed in the House and Senate last year as part of the coronavirus relief response, which would have required the Federal Reserve to create consumer accounts and deposit central bank digital currency in them. Those measures didn't pass. Um, uh, they were called digital uh, dollar wallets. In case you're interested, um, those bills were HR 6321 and Senate Bill 3571. But like I said, they didn't pass. Um, this is uh, something that we talked about before um, when I mentioned, um, yeah, the helicopter money. And then there's also some private initiatives that you um, might have read about. Um, in May 2021, the US nonprofit Digital Dollar Project, which is a partnership between Accenture and the Digital Dollar Foundation, they announced um, a launch of at least five pilot programs over the next 12 months um, to test the potential uses of a US CBDC. And the goal of this initiative is uh, really just to generate data on functional, sociological, business uses, benefits, and other facets of a US CBDC. Um, and so that this data can be used in research, in the public discussion, as well as inform um, policy considerations by Congress. Um, they also published a white paper. Um, so this is also something worth uh, looking into and a very interesting development. Um, and some of the in some of the advanced economies, um, like the United States, um, the question um, or the reasons for issuing CBDC um, uh, could also be just making payment systems uh, more efficient. So the question is really, is a CBDC necessary or can uh, we just improve um, the current system? For example, the Federal Reserve is working on the so-called FedNow service which would be a new instant payment service, which would enable all financial institutions to provide safe and efficient instant payment services in real time around the clock and every day of the year. So that might actually be an alternative for um, advanced economies if um, this is uh, the only reason why they're introducing a CBDC. So if it's one of the other reasons, or if it's in a more um, emerging market economy and they're really looking for a financial inclusion, um, then, uh, that would obviously not um, be a substitute for this. Um, but yeah, this is just one of the considerations. Okay, so this uh, concludes this part of my presentation. We will now move on to the uh, Q&A. And like I already mentioned, um, if I don't get to your question or if you have a question later on, you can always uh, submit them um, through our Ask a Librarian service. Um, you can see the address here on um, the PowerPoint. Um, you can also just go to law.gov. Uh, There's also a link to it. And I would also like uh, to mention our next foreign and comparative law webinar um, on June 17th, 2021. Um, it will be on new laws of China and how to find them online. So for example, if uh, this presentation um, got you interested in uh, China's digital currency and you want to research that more, it would probably be a good idea to attend that webinar um, to know how you can find uh, Chinese legislation. Okay, so I'm um, gonna take a second uh, to look at the Q and A. Um, and then I will answer those questions. So just give me a second. Um, I see the first question, um, I guess we already answered that, what countries are currently looking into utilizing implementing a CBDC? Um, so the ones I mentioned um, were the most interesting ones in my view, 
Um, and it's really like a lot of advanced uh, emerging markets economies that are looking into. There are others that I did not mention um, that are um, maybe in a more advanced state, but those are um, the most interesting ones and the ones that have been in the news lately. Um, the question, I have another question here, what would be the motivation for a private company to issue a digital currency? Um, so, um, for example, yeah, Facebook um, said that they, yeah, just um, they're a big company, they would like to, um, yeah, provide uh, services to people. Um, I mean, this has been criticized a lot. Um, I've seen other digital uh, uh, currencies issued by private companies. Um, they also mention other um, reasons. Um, I can't think of the name of, I saw another one. And they said that one of the reasons they would like to issue a digital currency is financial inclusion. Um, so that similar to, um, uh, yeah, the um, emerging market economies. So in particular with regard to cross-border um, payments, um, they say um, it would help. So, oh, the name was uh, Silo, I think, which is a blockchain payments platform. They said their main reason was uh, financial inclusion. The problem, though, with financial inclusion is also um, normally you need a smartphone um, for all these um, digital um, apps. So, sometimes people will not have the smartphone so th there's a question if um, you can ever really achieve financial inclusion with the cbdc <clears throat> so then um there's a question about um the fear of replacing uh, cbdc's replacing cash or bank deposits um and uh, the usage of credit cards. Do we know how credit card companies might react to CBDCs? Um, I guess uh, we already, uh, yeah, we actually heard about um, this uh, with regards, um, uh, we know that a lot of companies um, were supporting um, Facebook's Libra at the beginning or Facebook's DM, um, and then uh, after criticism, um, decided to end um, their um, collaboration. Um, so they're definitely um, interested um, and they're um, keeping track of all this. Um, and um, depending on how the individual CPDCs are structured and designed um, uh, with a different, uh, like how, uh, what type of wallet providers there will be, for example, um, then credit card companies might, um, yeah, actually participate. Um, so that's something to be seen. But I know they're definitely all um, uh, watching it. Um, we've uh, we've seen news that they're getting more involved with cryptocurrencies. Um, so I'm guessing um, they would also be involved in some way with uh, central bank digital currencies. Let's see. Um, so there's also the question, what's the difference between a digital currency and electronic bank deposits? So electronic bank deposits are digital currencies. So there's no difference. It's a electronic bank deposit is a type of digital currency. Um, the question, if CBDCs are widely adopted, what would that mean to Bitcoin and other digital currencies in use? Um, so that remains to be seen um, because um, the C CBDCs would just be a digital equivalent of cash. Um, so central banks are hoping um, that people will, yeah, use the central bank digital currencies, which are safer and a safer alternative um, than Bitcoin and other um, cryptocurrencies. Um, so people might um, not, so what they're hoping is, is that the CBDC will be used um, 
as a means of payment and not Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies anymore. Um, but the thing is, it will probably, cryptocurrencies will not go away just because central banks um, suddenly decide to issue digital money. Um, it's what I talked about that um, as long as people think that um, they are a store of value, um, then um, they will still be around, especially um, Bitcoin um, um, will still be around. Although the only problem with Bitcoin is, I guess, it has a, there's a fixed supply, whereas uh, fiat currencies, um, central banks control the supply and they can increase it, um, and which they have done, for example, in recent years with their um, quantitative easing programs. Um, so, I mean, what central banks are hoping if, if there's um, a high uptake of cryptocurrencies um, or um, by the public as a means of payment, and then central bank digital currencies are issued that people will come back to the central bank, they will not be replaced. Um, and normally from that opinion poll, um, it's most likely because people trust uh, the monetary uh, institutions more um, to issue digital currency, it's most likely um, that people will um, then use them more. But like I said, I don't think it will still definitely be an investment um, opportunity for people. So that will definitely not go away. Um, I see a question whether or not there's any effort to develop a global digital currency. Um, I have not um, read anything about a global digital currency. Um, and that would also be difficult because one of the definitions of a central bank digital currency is that it's in um, in the domestic um, currency. So um, that probably wouldn't work. Um, I mean, there's something to think about, uh, maybe special drawing rights um, from the IMF, um, but I haven't really read anything um, about that, um, that um, there have been, um, yeah, debates about that. Um, will the market price of the digital currency mirror the country's currency? Um, if they will um, be just a digital equivalent of cash, then yes. Um, so they will be the same. So you can either use cash or you can use digital currency, whatever um, is more convenient to you. Um, I also see that, is, are there any concerns that cryptocurrency will disintermediate central banks if the central banks don't move on issuing CBDCs? Yes, uh, for sure. So that's really uh, one of the reasons um, why central banks um, are looking into issuing CBDCs. Um, and because I mentioned um, cryptocurrencies um, issued by corporations um, or other um, private digital the tokens are very volatile. Um, there's not uh, no good um, consumer or investor protection. Um, so the functions of the central bank um, to maintain monetary and financial stability are at risk if they don't act. I see there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> um, and it's already actually past our time. Um, so I apologize if I did not um, uh, get to your question. Um, like I mentioned, you can always submit your question through our Ask a Librarian service. Um, and we, I will try to answer all of those. Um, in the slides, I also included uh, links to some of the documents I talked about today. Um, so when you receive the slides, you can click on the documents and then read more about it. And um, I wanted to thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, and we hope to see you soon again on um, our next webinar. Thank you very much.